Well, good morning. Uh, let me assure you that I am not at all legendary. Uh, I, there are members of my family who are, but I'm quite happy to be anonymous and let them be uh, legendary. I'm the youngest of four children. And uh, I was brought up in a little town, a city called Armagh in Northern Ireland. Some of you may have heard of Armagh. Uh, it's a very, it was and still is a very divided city with all the troubles and sectarian strife we have had over the years. But I was very fortunate to have two amazing parents who were believers, but they didn't force it down my throat. They taught me to think and encouraged me to think. They gave me space to think, to grow up, to ask questions, encouraged me to do that. They even encouraged me to play cricket and uh, all sorts of other things. And I'm so grateful for that background, the loving context in which I could develop as an individual, ask my questions, and come to a strong personal faith rather than a second-hand thing handed down. And I don't really know whether I believe this or not, but a strong personal faith. Since my late teens, I have been involved in teaching the Bible and discipling small groups in establishing new churches. And in 1988, uh, my wife and I um, established a new church near Belfast. Uh, it is still going. It's called Glen Abbey Church. Um, you can, you'll find it on the web if you Google it and, and, uh, and so on. So I was a school teacher. I taught French. Uh, possibly because my name is Gilbert or Gilbert in French. Um, Lennox is a Scottish name. Gilbert is, I think, a French name, ultimately. I'm not sure. Does it go into Spanish? Is Gilberto, does it? No, not really, yeah. German? Is there any German equivalent? Just Gilbert, yeah. Gilbert. Sure. And uh, yeah, so I taught French uh, for some years and taught rugby and drama and uh, religious education and all the other things you tend to do as a school teacher before eventually I realized that uh, the church was really where the Lord was calling me to. So that's what I have been doing. I retired a few years ago uh, from that, but I'm still actively involved in teaching the Bible in our home church and traveling a little bit now that the pandemic is over. This is my first time in Mallorca. So lovely to be here. Just a delight to join with you. This, this really reminds me so much of Glen Abbey Church. Uh, so it's, it's just a special delight where we are more relaxed, we're engaged with each other. There's a great sense of community and care for one another, and you're not worried about how people dress. And that's very important because I don't have my own clothes. So uh, <laughs> thank you to Rafa for, do you like the shirt he chose for me? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Excellent. Well, in a few weeks' time, I turn 70. And it is a serious age, apparently. You have to start being serious when you are 70. And you do tend to think a lot of things when you approach this age of 70. One of the things you ask is, how did I manage to survive so far? Another th question I ask is, how long will I still be able to hold a camera and take photographs? Because I do a lot of photography. What will old age look like for me as I get older and things begin to fall off or whatever happens to me as I get older. But one of the questions on my mind is this. How can I use the time I have to encourage especially the younger generation, not simply to trust in Christ, but to stay loyal to him? And those two things are extremely important because it isn't easy to be a Christian. It never has been. 
from day one. It still isn't, and there's good reason for that, because we follow a king that the world has rejected. So it's a different loyalty. And the difference between me and my friends who do not trust Christ is that I have a Lord and they don't. I have a king and they don't. I'm responsible to him. I trust him. I obey him. They don't. That creates tension sometimes and difficulty and suspicion and sometimes opposition. As Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. The gospel challenges all cultures. All cultures. It doesn't belong to the West, to the East, to the North, or the South. America, UK, Ireland, Spain. The gospel challenges all cultures. And thinking about that, got me looking at, well, how did Paul encourage younger people to stay loyal to Jesus? So I started reading again the very first part of the New Testament that I ever studied seriously as a student. And that was Paul's first letter to Timothy. And now we're going back to the 1970s when I was a student at Queen's University in Belfast. And I would like to read a few sentences from 1 Timothy. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, if you want to look it up. If you've got your Bible on your watch, your phone, uh, whatever. Isn't it weird to say things like that? Bibles on your watches. And, anyway, this is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. And by the way, can you understand me okay? My accent, is it all right? Uh, you're very kind. But <laughs> if you feel you need to stand up here and translate for me or interpret for me, that's even worse. <laughs> First Timothy 1.12. And Paul is very personal to Timothy here. They knew each other very well. But now he's writing this letter. I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace, there's our word again, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example for all who were to believe in him for eternal life. And now notice this last sentence. To the king of ages, the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, he had left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to teach and to protect and nourish the new and growing Christian community there. They were a tiny minority in a huge, important city. So it was a tough assignment. Ephesus was very prosperous. Lots of different cultures. It was cosmopolitan. But in particular, it was a city where the main values were economic, like most great cities in the world even today. It was driven by commerce, by money. And materialistic cultures always produce spiritual emptiness in human beings. Produces like a... a 
a spiritual vacuum. And you know what a vacuum does? It sucks all the rubbish in. And that's what happens as people search for deeper meaning and value in life, they'll end up believing anything. They dabble in everything. All kinds of religions were practiced in Ephesus. They specialized in spiritism and in the occult. It was a, an ancient melting pot of spiritualities and different philosophies. And these things were impacting the church. It wasn't just outside the church. There were teachers going around who had fallen under the influence of these other ideas. And Paul goes into some detail, I'm not going to do that, of what these guys were doing. They were the kind of people who didn't want to stick to what the Bible said. They wanted to go beyond. So they would take a little phrase and then they would speculate and they would develop all kinds of myths. And then that had the effect of getting the Christians arguing with each other over things that weren't even in the Bible, but they got them arguing. That's what happens. They speculate, they argue, they go off at tangents and argue about stuff that couldn't be proved one way or the other and got people all hot and bothered. They obviously were very Irish uh, in Ephesus. Some teachers were openly materialistic because they were teaching that godly living is a means to financial prosperity. That's what they were teaching back then in the first century. Now, if you go on to YouTube or whatever, not be long before you'll find teachers like that on our screens, but it was right there in the first century that godliness is a means of gain. It was very popular, you can understand that, but it was very wrong. Others seemed to be much more spiritual. They were more austere. They wanted to be teachers of the law. And not only teachers of the law, but they invented laws and all kinds of laws. And they piled them up and they taught people that the way to be truly spiritual is to get all these laws, all these rules and regulations into your life. And they give the impression to people that Christianity is all about keeping rules and regulations. And if you do it well enough, then maybe God will smile on you in the end. And it's a mistake that has bedeviled the Christian church since then. We have it in Ireland. And it was wrong. So Timothy was trying in the midst of all of this. And Timothy was a young man. Uh, he had a very different personality from Paul. He was sensitive. We're all different, you see, aren't we? And we have different personalities. And when it comes to serving the Lord, our personalities come into it and he was very sensitive and he could be intimidated by strong, confident personalities to the point, actually, it seems, that his own health suffered. And some of us perhaps can relate to that. That stress has an effect on us. That just working hard and long and maybe being misunderstood and maybe being criticized and finding a difficulty and you feel you're bashing your head against a brick wall constantly. That's what we say in Ireland. Does it translate? Yes. And, and it has an effect on your health to the point where it's easy to wonder, is this worth it? Is it worth this grief to serve Jesus? So how does Paul encourage him? And he does it by pointing him to the king. And I love this. Chapter one, unto the king, eternal, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. And then again in chapter six, it's interesting. And for those of you who want to do a little bit of extra Bible study, you know, if, it's, if it rains tomorrow afternoon and you have nothing else to do, a cup of coffee, get your New Testament out, and here's a little task for you. 
Take 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 and compare the two. You will find fascinating things. Paul wasn't writing just haphazardly. The first thing that came into his head. The two chapters are like a mirror image of each other. Similarities and contrasts. Fascinating. And in chapter 6, Paul returns to this and he describes God as the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone, he says, who is immortality. He dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So you've got two amens in this letter. One in chapter one, one in chapter six, and they're both talking about God as king. And this is unusual for Paul referring to God as king it's not normally what he does but he's writing to Timothy a young man he wants to get him to look up and see the king so encouraging for us to look up and realize similar vision given to John in Revelation You know the the story how you saw a door open into heaven? And you know, when you see a door open, you want to go through it and see what's on the other side. And so he goes and he looks through the door and he sees and he sees a throne. And it's occupied. The Lamb is in the center of the throne. We look at the world around us and it looks chaotic, even worse than my journey yesterday, which seemed chaotic. Computer's down, there's no control. Life's a bit like that, isn't it? Seems like that. And to be taken through the door to look at the king on the throne and to have your confidence restored that in the midst of what seems like chaos, the king is on the throne. Timothy, look to the king. But what kind of king is he? We have a king now in the United Kingdom, King Charles. You have a king in Spain, I believe. Do you still have a king? Yes. So what kind of a king? Is he a tyrant? Is he a despot? Is he like Nero? But he's invisible, Paul says. No one has ever seen him. No one can see him. So how can we know what the king is like? It's one thing to look towards the king, but if you can't see him, I mean, what are we looking at? Some vague notion in our head? Do we have to invent this? Dream it up? Well, no. Paul's answer to Timothy is, look at Jesus because Jesus shows you what the king is like. If you want to know the heart of this king, if you want to know the nature of his government. Do you know our governments change all the time? Certainly in the United Kingdom they do. How many prime ministers did we have last year? I have lost count. (coughs) Apparently somebody called Liz Truss was prime minister for a while. Amazing. Every time a new prime minister comes in, the question you ask is this. What's the character of this government? What, what's it going to do differently? What's the nature of this government? And everybody's just a little bit insecure. And they had good reason. What's the nature of this king? What is he like? Well, Christ has interpreted him for us. What is he like? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's fantastic. This is the king himself coming in person into our world. What to do? To beat everybody over the head? No. He came into the world to save sinners of whom, says Paul, I am the main one. Now, you may think you're the main one. One of the features of getting old, let me share this, and it'll not cost you anything. Okay, so I'm not going to charge extra for this. One of the things about getting old 
is that you have this, I have 70 years of sin in my head. Actions I regret. Thoughts that I just can't believe I thought that way. Things I said that I just wish I had never said. That's one of the things you have. And you can so easily think, there's no way, God, this king, eternal, holy, could ever want me in his kingdom. I pity. But Paul says, however bad you think you are, Gilbert, I'm the worst. And he's not exaggerating for effect. He means it. Listen to him. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Well, I wasn't any of those things. (laughs) And those are just the headlines. Timothy knew the details. But let me read you Paul giving some of the details of what he was like. This is Acts 26. In front of a pagan king, Agrippa II, this is what he said. I was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. This is Paul. And I punished them often. In all the synagogues, I tried to make them blaspheme. In other words, he tortured them. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. These are Paul's own words. This is the kind of man he was. Raging fury. Paul was no, you know, closet academic. This was a passionate man who opposed the Christians. What changed him? Well, he tells a story at midday, O king. I saw on the way to Damascus a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, what a shock to his system. Paul was a man who believed that the God of Israel was the one true God. There was no point in telling Paul to keep the law better. He he was zealous for it. But he discovered this devastating irony in his own life. He was preaching the king's law while at the same time he was persecuting the king. I mean, what a shock to discover that in his life. He thought he was keeping the law when in fact he was opposing the lawgiver. He thought he was reverencing God. It turned out he didn't even know him. And the shock must have been enormous. It just reveals how blind and ignorant the human heart can be. But there was a second shock. When the voice spoke to him, Paul asked, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? He used a Greek word, kurios, that is Lord God, Yahweh in Hebrew. Who are you, God, Yahweh? He knew it was God speaking, obviously. Who else would it be? Certainly wasn't Jesus of Nazareth whom he was persecuting. Who are you? Who are you really? And the answer? I am Jesus. I mean, the shock. Can you imagine it? The Jesus he was persecuting is the Lord God. Paul had been opposing him all along. But Jesus was Lord. He was alive, risen from the dead. There was no doubt anymore. So Paul's opposition to Jesus was actually blasphemy. And then there was a third shock. Paul 
was the chief sinner, the chief rebel. What was the king's attitude towards the chief rebel? What would you have done with Paul if you had been king? What would I have done with him? Well, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It was precisely for the poles of this world that Jesus came. This is how the king, this is his heart towards a rebellious world, a world that has turned its back on God. His heart is revealed in Jesus. Yes, one day he will hold the world to account because sin matters, rebellion matters. But God has come in person to provide this answer to our rebellion at huge personal cost. When Paul says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, he means he became a human being. He walked among us. He was persecuted, misunderstood, mistreated, and eventually we butchered him on a cross. The king butchered on a cross because he comes into the world to save sinners. Again, another shock. But then there's this fourth shock. As Paul explains it to Timothy, listen to these words again. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength. Now listen, that he considered me trustworthy and appointed me to his service. I mean, I said reverently, but has God lost his mind? To consider Paul trustworthy. And it wasn't that he waited for 30 years to see how he would turn out. I mean, from day one, when Jesus appeared to him, this is what he said, but rise, stand up on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and a witness of the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. And this, this, is, this is lovely. I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What a, what a commission. Day one. It's amazing. The grace of our Lord, says Paul, was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, when I read that verse first, I thought Paul was talking about his faith and love in Christ, but he's not. He's talking about Christ's faith and love in him. So not only does God forgive us, but he trusts us. Entrusts us with the gospel. Entrusts us to be a servant. Entrusts us to be his witnesses in a dark world. This is amazing. Paul never got over it. So he wrote to the church of Galatia, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What other motivation do we need? You know, sometimes I give the impression that God is a hard taskmaster. Sometimes the way I talk about myself and the troubles I've been through and all the rest of it, you would think, that, oh, Gilbert's a martyr and God is lucky to have him. <laughs> Listen, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I don't need any more motivation than that. God is the best God boss in the world. He's the best boss in the world. I don't want to serve anybody else. Whatever he takes me through. Because who else treats you like this? Who else entrusts you with the greatest message in the world? 
I mean, God trusting us to be ophthalmologists. This is amazing. To carry out eye surgery with all these blind people to open their eyes. It's just, this is just mind boggling. I mean, when I saw in biology class in school, I wanted to be a, a medical doctor. That was my ambition when I was 15. And they brought out a model of the human eye and I fainted in the class. <laughs> I can hardly believe it. So I wasn't cut out to be a doctor. But to have this privilege, to open the eyes of people who just can't see it. What an amazing thing to be involved in this. Everybody is looking for light, whether consciously or unconsciously. Light on their big questions, light on their moral confusion, light on life and whether it has any meaning or not. I'm sure you're surrounded by people in Mallorca, especially people as they get older. What was this for? Is there any meaning? Is there anything more to this? Or, or is this it? The gospel is a message of light and of hope. And second, he said, so that they may turn from the power of Satan to God. The problem of evil runs deep and it's not just a human problem. His satanic majesty is at work. It doesn't excuse human fault and sin, but this is a kind realism. Paul, you need to realize that behind the evil in this world, there is a malevolent being. He's pulling the strings. You need to understand that. You're getting involved in a war. Now I'm calling you to participate in it, but there is a power in the gospel to do what we cannot do, and that is to deliver people from evil. And thirdly, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Isn't it a marvelous thing? To be able to share with somebody, do you know, you can know now forgiveness on the whole of your life, peace with God, not having to wait and wonder till the final examination on what your result will be, but to have already passed from judgment into life, from death into life because of what Jesus has done. What an amazing message. But it goes further. And so that they may receive an inheritance. I mean, <laughs> this is just amazing. I remember I was once left an inheritance by someone who nursed me when I was little. My mother was very ill when I was born and you probably can understand why when you look at me now. So she was, she was very ill when I was born and I had to be looked after by a nurse and this nurse liked me, Nurse Johnson. And she left me some money in her will. I was very excited. It was this princely sum of 200 pounds. Wonderful. I had spent that about a thousand times in my mind, what I would spend it on. I'll not tell you what I bought. I'll just leave that for next time. Um, an inheritance. It's exciting to think about. An inheritance. How, do you think about it often as to what this inheritance is? That he gifts us when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you? That's 2,000 years ago. It's a, some preparation. You know, it only took me six months to paint the bedroom. I mean, how long does it take the Lord Jesus to prepare heaven to receive us? An inheritance that is kept for us, incorruptible. Death is not the end. And everybody around us who doesn't know Christ, death is the final horizon. Oh, they have all kinds of vague hopes and various theories they spin to try to reduce the sting of it, but it's there. But in Christ, death has been abolished and one day will be finally removed. This is the gospel of the king. Paul is taking the opportunity 
to remind Timothy, to point his eyes to this king revealed in Jesus. The king eternal, not subject to time, immortal. He cannot be corrupted. What a wonderful thing. Oh, our governments are full of corruption. This king cannot be corrupted. He doesn't decay, he doesn't change. His character revealed in Jesus will never change. He's invisible. He's beyond material confines. You can't put God in a test tube. You can't reduce God to scientific scrutiny. But he's a God who speaks, who reveals his glory in the creation around us in his word and supremely in the beautiful person of Jesus, the only God, not one amongst many, not first amongst equals, not the Christian God as opposed to all the other gods, no rivals, the only God. This is how Paul encourages a young man to stay strong, to remain loyal, because he's serving the best boss in the world. Let's pray for a moment together. Thank you so much for these wonderful words that you gave Paul to write to his young friend. Words that still live and speak powerfully to our own hearts today. In the busyness and chaos often of our lives, help us to take time out to allow these words to sink into our hearts and minds, to expand our vision of who you are, of what you've called us to, of what this gospel is, of why you still have us here on earth, of your amazing grace and trust in us to serve you. And Lord, I pray for this church in Mallorca that you will encourage all to stay loyal to you, to live as lights to the culture around them with grace and truth and compassion and love and hope. Encourage them, we pray. May the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrate where we cannot and change lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.